have, have people you trust and people you know working on it. So um, I've always had a computer. So I can remember growing up and things go wrong and sometimes they work well and sometimes you want to know the latest and greatest stuff. So Mankato Computer Technology has always been a great place for me to go since I moved to Mankato um, to help me with all their stuff. <laughs> and then uh, one day, when I was working at another job, I ran into a customer who was going to be meeting with the guys from Mankato Computer Technology, and I was able to give them a little bit of a heads up on what was going on, and we tried to figure out if there was a way that I could work with customers that might not need a full-on service call or a tech call, but um, just maybe some friendly computer advice. And a lot of this stems from just with my mom, um, who my mom is uh, 65 this year. And she uh, has had a lot of jobs related to the uh, telecommunications industry, is relatively technically proficient, but runs into uh, difficulties when anything changes, whenever there's an upgrade or a change. Um, so these end up in late night phone calls. Uh oh, okay, the screen's coming up. Uh, these end up in late night phone calls with uh, my mom asking questions like, it says click OK to continue, what do I do? Um, but she's getting much better and she's posting lots of stuff on Facebook lately that's actually really entertaining about um, what a Zoom call for somebody over the age of 65 looks like and sounds like and uh, she posted another one today. So she's getting the hang of it and, um, and I still have plenty of technology problems. I was on the phone with Apple tech support this weekend um, but it really helped just knowing what I was talking about and being able to kind of guide them in like, Hey, I don't know if I've been hacked or I don't know if something bad has happened. Um, and it's, it's funny that as much technology as we teach, I, I always default to, it's nice to have somebody you can talk to face to face or somebody you can call on the phone to say, um, I think what's going wrong. And so this is my attempt at trying to be that person for the, uh, the people that are all connected to the vine to know that. If you have questions or you want to ask us about something that um, this is a, a good safe place for us to talk about um, computer problems that you're having or questions that you want to have answered so we try to pick topics that are relevant to what's going on or to requests from Mike and we do a little bit of presenting and what I always like to start with is if anybody has any questions or things that they really want to learn about the cloud that's this week's topic or this month's topic, um, what the cloud is and how does it work. We've got a couple of great videos that I found today on YouTube that we'll share, because um, me talking for an hour and a half gets a little boring. So um, hopefully that'll lead to some questions and dialogue. I know there was a specific question that was sent to me from someone that wanted to know how to get their pictures out of the cloud. And um, there's lots of different ways to do that. So depending on the device that you're using and the cloud service that you're using, um, but maybe by explaining what the cloud is and how it works a little bit, we'll be able to address that. And if we haven't addressed that by the end of the class, um, then we can uh, address it then. Colin, before, I know you got the uh, presentation all fired up here, but before we get started, in case anybody's got split screen or it's not gonna be too confusing, do you wanna show people how they can access the slides um, themselves, how they can get it off the website? Yep, I can do that. Um... Can everybody see my uh, uh, my browser here? Yep, looks good. Okay, so our website is mankatotext.com, um, which you can find by typing mankatotext.com or, or doing a Google search for Mankato Computer Technology. Um, the uh, All of our presentations are, if you go to the homepage here and hover your mouse over the About section, you'll see this drop down. Um, and the presentations tab is at the very bottom there. If you click on those, you'll see all of the presentations that we've done at Vine going all the way back to 2018. Um, and you can uh, click on those. They're all in PDF form, so they should load up right in your browser. Um, there's also an option to download them um, or print them from here as well. So if you want to download them, just hit that icon there. Or if you want to print, uh, you can feel free to do that as well. Um, so that's a, a good way that you can go back and reference these in the future. Um, or if you want to uh, work along with us now as we, as we go through um, and uh, have a little bit better view, uh, that's where you find that. 
Yep, and that comes in really handy too when we're doing the classes at the Vine and in person um, in case you want to bring your device and have them. Um, I try to make the font as big as I can um, for the slide presentations, um, but sometimes I get wrapped up in making the backgrounds look really pretty too and uh, it makes it hard to make uh, the font as big so that everybody can see it. So this gives you a personal way to look at it or a personal way to review it later. And is a great reference if you want to ask questions. We try to keep all the hyperlinks updated. So um, a lot of times in these presentations, there's not enough that I can talk about in an hour and a half, or there's so much stuff that I can't talk about at all in an hour and a half. So I tr <clears throat> try to provide links that you could go back in the presentation and look at later. So um, we'll start with the presentation. We're going to talk about the cloud. How does it work? What are some things we can do with it? And we're going to try something new this week. I hope Colin test drove it. We got some videos. Say, uh, Trevor? Yeah. I see uh, the record light is on. So can we also mentioned that we'll have this presentation available probably on our on the Vine YouTube page, if that's something you guys usually share that right away. So okay. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate all the work that you guys have done uh, in this difficult time so that we can continue to have these presentations through Vine. No, it's, it's my pleasure, and honestly, as much of a tech person as I am, this is only my second time leading a Zoom call, and the first one was last week, or last month, and ironically, my Zoom quit about 20 minutes left in the meeting, so I couldn't even finish the presentation. I felt really bad, um, but hopefully this week will go a lot smoother. So, uh, Colin, roll on with the video. I don't have sound, Colin. No sound? I don't have sound. Okay, give me one second here. No? No, still no audio. And it's okay. With the, both the video links are in the presentation. So if you download it, you can check them out later. The great recap of everything that we're going to talk about. Like I said, I just thought you'd get bored of listening to me talk for an hour and a half. So I thought putting some other people in there might work out. Um, something new that we tried. And sometimes with technology, things that you try don't always work. So it's all right, Colin. We can go to the first slide and either try this later or other people can try it again on their own. So two videos about what is the cloud and then um, basically what we're looking at is cloud storage is a, a way to store your data um, on a location that's not at your computer. So it doesn't go onto your computer, it doesn't go onto an external hard drive, it doesn't go onto a thumb drive, it gets stored on a computer that's in another location. So using the internet, um, it sends your information to another like a warehouse which is one of the really cool things in the video. If you get a chance to go back and look at them, it has pictures of a lot of the um, storage warehouses or data warehouses where they just have lines and lines and rows and rows of computers where they store your stuff. So um, it sends your files via a data server that's maintained by a cloud provider instead of storing it on your hard drive. So it's basically a way to store your information in a remote location. Go ahead, Colin. So in simplest terms, it means storing and accessing data and programs, which is something new, um, being able to not just store your files, but now you're actually able to store um, programs on there. We'll talk about how this works out really well later, but it gives people access to computer programs that maybe instead of buying the whole package, they just want to use it for a little while. So you can have access to that program for a 30 day sample period, or you can have access to that program for one day at a time if you wanted to um, and use it and see how you like it or just use it as you need it and pay for what you need as you go. Also works that way for storage, um, depending on how much storage you wanna use via some of the different providers, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So where is the cloud? <clears throat> Basically what the cloud is, is um, all the storing and retrieving of your personal or company data 
is going to be on your own little area on the internet. If you think of it that way, it's an easier way to think of it than it's at some warehouse in a building somewhere else that I don't know. So if you think of it just being in the internet, <clears throat> that you have your own little personal hard drive out on the internet somewhere, um, that's a great way to think about it. That gives you much more of like the cloud reference um, versus thinking like, oh, my stuff is on somebody else's computer or somewhere else. So rather than being stored on your local hard drive, it's accessible from any location on any device, which is another cool part is that if you just save something on your computer and you wanted to access it from your phone, there are ways to do that with a, a network server, um, but it gets really expensive and really costly. So this makes accessing your files or your programs from any of your devices really cool. Um, Windows 10 has done a tremendous job with creating logins um, so that when you type in your login to a computer that you're licensed to use, <clears throat> it basically can look the same and you can have access to all of your programs, which is a really neat thing. Um, for example, I downloaded a game for one of my kids on Windows 10, and now I can download that game on any of my Windows 10 computers, no matter where I was. So if we went to my parents' house in South Dakota, and my kids were like, I really want to play this game, I can log into my mom's computer because she's part of my family, and then I can download that game from the cloud, and my kids could play that game at my parents' house as well. So um, it works out kind of kind of cool if you're going to use different programs and you want to have access to it on different machines in different locations. Well, and another thing to remember about this is it's not just that your information is being stored on on a device or a server somewhere around the world. The companies that that sell cloud storage have redundant servers all over the world. So uh, you know if something happens to uh, you know, there's a natural disaster in one part of the world and, and something happens to that, uh, that data farm or that server farm, um, your data is, is stored uh, redundantly um, in multiple locations all over the world. And that gives a level of safety that, you know, just doing a simple backup can't, can't accomplish. Well, they also mentioned that it's safer to have your data stored out in the cloud across multiple locations, like Colin was saying, than just on your computer alone or your one device. So um, the second video that we downloaded has a great example of what happens on your phone and how things are um, uh, stored on your phone and in the cloud. Because if you were to lose your phone or if anybody's purchased a new phone recently upgraded from uh, an older iPhone to a new iPhone, you can just go to the store or you can just use the cloud and press a button when you restore your phone and have it set up to be exactly like your old phone was set up. So that's pulling all the data right out of the cloud. Um, they actually say it's harder um, to steal your information from the cloud than it would be if someone actually stole your computer and just needed to get the data or the information off the hard drive or off the physical device. So um, the, the cloud has, it's safer, it's more, um, it's not as prone to natural disasters or, um, thieving or getting stolen. So uh, to have your data on one of those uh, data farms like Colin saying or multiple data farms provides a level of safety and security that keeps your information protected and access to it in a variety of situations. So um, so uh, one of my, my scrolling didn't work. I did a spell check on this, but I don't know why that happened. But um, software and services that run on the internet instead of locally on your computer. Most cloud services can be accessed through a web browser. So Firefox is a web browser. Google Chrome is a web browser. Um, Colin, we go through this, this list all the time. Um, Microsoft's new one, is it still Internet Edge? Yep, Edge is, although they just did a, a, a full renovation of Edge to make it a little bit more like Chrome, so. Right. And uh, I mean, those are the big three. Uh, Google, uh, Apple has Safari. And um, so each one of those, you can access cloud-based programs or cloud-based storage. And uh, we'll talk about who provides those cloud areas as well. But you're going to need an internet browser or internet connection to access that. So um, if you're still confused by the cloud, so this must ha be what happens when I um, try to make the font really big. Is it looked really nice until I blew up all the fonts. So I'm sorry for some of the uh, overlap. It looks different when I do it on my machine. Um, here's all you need to know about the technology that is transform computing. With all the talk about the cloud, you'd be um, thinking that technology is somehow harnessed to deliver all these applications. 
Um, but the cloud can also help us do things like catch up on missed TV programs, keeping important files safe. Go ahead, Colin. A couple of these roll pretty quick. In reality, the cloud is just shorthand for cloud computing, which just refers to the idea of using someone else's computers, usually or not always, but operated like a business. So like Colin said, um, Apple, Amazon, Google, eBay. I don't, know, I don't know if eBay has a server one. What are some of the other big servers, Colin? I think I hit up most of them. Well, Amazon now accounts for something like 70% of the hosting. So even, even for, there are some backup services that, uh, you know, we would consider having their own cloud, but it's within Amazon's servers. Um, so Amazon's a huge one. Google obviously is a huge one. Microsoft is a, is a huge one. Uh, Apple is a, is a huge one. There's some smaller ones uh, here and there, but uh, usually they'll be renting uh, space from, from those big deals. four. Yep. So, um, as our picture files get bigger and bigger, as our music files get bigger and bigger, as we have access to digital media that's going on, you know, 10, 15 years now, and you get, you have pictures from that far back. And depending on if you take a lot of pictures, if you were to keep up with the amount of storage that you would need to have on your computer, you know, your desk or your table that your computer's on would just be full of hard drives, or you'd be having to buy a new computer every couple of years, like you used to have to back in the early 2000s when, you know, you'd run out of storage really fast after you downloaded just a couple of songs or um, took just a couple of pictures or downloaded your digital camera. Um, now you can, with the amount of cloud storage that you can get or you can buy, you don't have to keep upgrading your computer um, to buy more memory or more storage. You can just access more and more on the cloud. So it prevents you from having to really um, keep up with the data storage on your computer. So the cloud is everywhere, just like the meteorology, meteor meteorological namesake. Um, it's anywhere that there's a computer and an internet connection, you can access the cloud. Um, a cloud application or a program usually runs on multiple or sometimes like Colin says, hundreds of powerful internet connected computers. And uh, you don't need to know any of this. You just need to know that you have to sign into the application using a web browser and that it's available instantly. So, some of the things that you can think about uh, that you might be using already when we talk about the entertainment, like Netflix, YouTube, um, you know, those are going to be services that you want to watch a specific movie or you want to do a specific application and you don't know where the computers that you'll be getting that are from. Um, it's really powerful. It's actually really amazing. Um, it allows organizations to provide applications that can be used by lots of people around the world all at the same time. Um, and without, and with someone else doing all, with their computer doing all the work, your computer doesn't have to be, be specced up to, like I said, you're, you're in to improve your memory or your hard drive space. You don't have to have a supercomputer to be able to do the things that other people that have supercomputers are allowing you to access by using the cloud. Um, running applications like Microsoft Office, Microsoft Office now has online um, applications. So instead of the package, like you have to buy, you used to have to buy Microsoft Office on like a CD-ROM. So now you can access mobile applications that are based in the cloud to run Microsoft Office. Um, you used to need a really powerful computer with lots of space to be able to do that, which is not something everybody can afford anymore. Now they have, I mean, the, the, the Google Chromebook is a computer that runs solely on the cloud. It doesn't actually carry many programs on the computer itself which leaves it, if it has an internet connection though, it can be as powerful as most um, PCs are based on the things that it can do. So there's Office Suite, Google Docs, um, which is really similar to Microsoft Office. It's just Google's own platform. Um, on the other hand, it provides much of the same features just on, on very low spec PCs. So you don't have to have like a supercomputer to do all the cool things on the internet um, that you would if you were just gonna be able to have a standalone machine and run all these kind of programs. So you put all that, that stuff together with the everywhere nature of the cloud and it makes applications much more flexible. So um, in the past, documents and applications were locked onto one computer unless you carried them around and risked losing them on a floppy disk or a CD or a USB flash drive. Um, even cloud-based computing has come a long way in the past, I don't know, 10 years when you started off uh, Dropbox and Colleen, correct me on the timeline if you know it better than me, but I mean, Dropbox was one of the first kind of uh, cloud-based servers for documents where 
I could put in a file and share it and then Colin could access it and change it and then I could um, download it again and I could see Colin's changes. Now you have things like Google Docs where you can actually work in real time. So if I'm in a Google Doc and Colin's in a Google Doc, I can see where he's at in the document. I can see where he's making changes. Um, OneDrive also makes that possible with the sharing of documents. Um, and so you can operate in real time where you used to have to kind of like, okay, you could upload it to the cloud and somebody could download it from the cloud. But if you made changes while somebody else was working on a previous version, it got really confusing. So just how fast the cloud has gotten and good it's gotten with um, being able to work in really real time and facilitate that is really amazing. So cloud applications or programs also allow you to access your documents and applications anywhere. So like I gave the example of my kids with a video game, um, other things besides video games would be like, um, I think of one a long time ago was Corel Draw, um, and now Adobe Photoshop would be another one where it's like a huge program and it's really expensive, but if you just need to use a small part of that, um, you can buy, you can access just a piece of that via the cloud or just use it for a little while to make some changes or do some of the things that you need to do. Um, Mike brought up a good point that the cloud uh, up, does all your updates on your software for you. Mike, that must be something, you brought it up a couple times about updating your software, so that must be something that you're seeing a lot. So yeah, the cloud will update all your programs for you automatically, um, so that's, that's a really nice idea. However, you do have to be prepared for the fact that you might log in, you know, one day and then the next day you log in again and things could change because of upgrades. So um, toolbars and locations or convenience items. So you want to try to keep up on those things as much as you can. Um, the cloud isn't owned or managed by anyone or any one organization. It's a collective term for a variety of applications operated by many different ones. So um, big space. <clears throat> Um, Google is one of the major cloud players, as is YouTube for video sharing. <clears throat> Collins mentioned Amazon multiple times um, as far as the data farms. Microsoft's also uh, using major cloud companies along with a host of others that operate behind the scenes to make cloud applications possible. So lots of well-known applications now are also cloud-based. Um, genuine advantages to switching to the cloud. <clears throat> um, it's an easy way to keep your files safe and secure. You don't have to worry about um, your thumb drive going missing or leaving it somewhere. Um, somebody trying to steal your computer uh, keeps all those data and files safe. It synchronizes automatically. Um, one of my favorite things about cloud storage, basically on the ones that I'm using now, which is mostly Microsoft and Google, is that it, since it saves automatically, um, you don't have to really work on that save early, save often. I still hear, hear stories. I've got a, a friend that's a good engineer and he was working on his Apple computer and was working on a document and they were changing the power meters in his neighborhood and he didn't have his computer charged up. So they took the power meter off, shut off power to his house. He lost everything that he was working on because he wasn't saving off enough. now if he was working on a cloud-based program instead of something that was just on his computer, um, it probably would have had a backup version because it saves almost instantly. Like I said, that's where you can work together in real time, um, which is really cool. Um, one of the things that's tricky to figure out, and I still struggle with a little bit, but I rely on people like Colin and our tech support team here at work, is having a version of a folder that you can access on your computer that has access to the documents that are online and in the cloud as well as it gives you an ability to download that file to your computer if you wanted to have access to it. So um, it's getting a lot more streamlined. It was a little wonky when it all started out a couple years ago, but it's getting way better at, <clears throat> as soon as you open the version on your computer that you have stored on your computer, it knows, okay, there's also a version of this on the cloud. So as you change the one that you're working on on the computer, it'll give you an opportunity to change the versions that are on your cloud, which is called syncing or synchronizing the files that you want to have. We talk about this in our backup class too, is um, finding ways to let your computer sync with the cloud or sync with the backup device. So um, you want to make sure that any changes that you make, that you have a history of it, um, helps also with if you accidentally deleted a file, if you saved it in the cloud, you might be able to pull it back out, depending on if you accidentally deleted it from your computer or vice versa, if you accidentally delete it from the cloud and you still have a copy on your hard drive and your local computer, 
you can sync it back up to the cloud, which is kind of cool. So great way to keep backup of important files that you can access over any internet connection. <clears throat> more and more applications are using the cloud. So um, renting and buying video and audio from the cloud. You used to, like with um, iTunes, you used to have to buy the music or buy the song. And then you owned it and you downloaded a version onto your computer. Um, now they've gone to more streaming services. If you've heard of streaming services, if you're using streaming services, you're actually accessing data from the cloud. Or if you have subscription music services, that means you're using the audio or the video that they have stored in the cloud and pulling it down onto your computer so that you can listen to it right away or watch it right away without having to have a copy of it on your computer. So streaming and the cloud kind of go hand in hand. Um, you don't need to store anything on your PC, so huge files, huge movie and audio files won't have to be stored on your computer when you try to watch them. It's another great benefit. Um, cloud access is generally free. Um, you can get a lot of the base services for free. You have to have an internet connection, so at some point you'll have to either pay or know somebody that has an internet connection. Um, and then there are some that have a subscription service. So a lot of places will give you a you know, it's, uh, they give you a small taste and you go, Ooh, this is a lot of fun and this is really cool. And you're like, Ooh, if I had more, I could do even more cool things, but to get more then that's when they charge you the money. Um, many paid for cloud applications that pay as a monthly subscription. So you can pay for when you need access and stop when you don't, um, for a few hundred dollars, a box cop. This was the example I was given of Adobe Photoshop. Colin, do you want to run down? I know you know the prices way better than me because I just pay my annual subscription, but like how Microsoft works with the Office subscription or I don't know that part where they give you the terabyte on OneDrive. Yeah, so uh, there's, there's separate pricing if you just want to buy storage for OneDrive. Otherwise, uh, th people who are have a, an Office 365 subscription, which for a home license costs about $8 a month, that gives you all of the Office applications, so Outlook, Word, Excel, Access, uh, PowerPoint, et cetera. Um, and then it also gives you up to a terabyte of storage in OneDrive, which is Microsoft's cloud storage solution, um, which is a ton of storage for most consumers or, or regular computer users. You're not gonna fill that up um, unless you're you know, taking huge three hour long uh, home movies of, of the ripples and the waves off the end of the dock, but which my father's been known to do, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, you know, something that we see here a little bit is uh, we do some home security solution, business security solutions. And so um, cloud-based security cameras is a really cool way to access, you know, like Colin said, you're gonna have hours and hours of video. Um, if you were gonna try to store that all on site, it takes up a ton of space. So um, that's another great benefit to it. Um, all cloud applications need an internet connection, but not all require a constant connection. So like I said, some of them, you can download the files from the cloud and then work on them and then wait till you have an internet connection again. So um, my easiest example I can think of for this is that Netflix has several movies that you can download. So my kids have iPods, but they don't have iPhones. So they don't have data or internet connection when we get in the car. So I tell them before we're going on the road trip, like, hey, pick five or six movies that you want to watch, download them from Netflix. And then when we get in the car tomorrow, you can have them on your device and then you can watch them while we're driving, even though they don't have internet and they don't have data. So um, that's a great example of being able to use the cloud at home, get the data, put it on your device, and then use it somewhere else you go. Um, also it could be used besides entertainment purposes, could be used for uh, data or documents or pictures. If you're like, oh, I'm going to my friend's house and I want her to see all the pictures that I took. I mean, and, but she doesn't have good internet at her house. Let me download all these pictures on my device, I'll take them over to her and then she can look at them because I know we don't have internet over there. So um, the more you download, the faster speed you want to have. And again, that comes to your internet service provider a little bit more than it does your cloud. So the cloud does use data, as I was mentioning. So if, depending on your plan, um, I don't think we have any home metered connections anymore, Colin. Like, I don't think or anybody has metered connections for how much you download, do they? 
Uh, no, it's typically f- more for uh, for mobile data that you're going to run into yeah. issues like that. Uh, there are some artificial caps that uh, the ISPs have been saying on, on the really high end that they're going to limit bandwidth if they see certain people exceeding uh, these data caps because, in theory, their networks are, are going to be overrun. But uh, over the last couple of months of the lockdown uh we've been exceeding those um and the isps have not been enacting those caps um and there there haven't been widespread outages thank you knock on wood um so uh yeah it's primarily mobile data i should say uh trevor real quick here um last time we did this uh when we were nearing the time limit for the zoom uh conference we got free time as a, a little pop-up that you know zoom let us extend and i'm yeah. told that they might not be doing that all the time anymore um okay so if we do get booted off here uh i will restart the session if people want to click on i think we're probably about 10 minutes away from that um okay so if if everybody gets booted off all of a sudden uh just try clicking on the link again and we'll we'll try to pick up where we left off i did see a little pop up come up say that it was extended time but it didn't say how much and so that's when last time when i got kicked off i was like oh i guess that's it i guess i'm done for today but uh, apparently everybody else got to stay on the call um so uh yeah, it, a great example that I had a tech support person give me one time when I had to call about something was if you think of it like a highway, um, you know, they told me that my service was slow on Friday nights after five o'clock because that's when everybody came home from work and everybody in my neighborhood was downloading movies or watching movies or a sporting event or something. So, you know, Sunday football, am I uh, like my wife loves to watch the Vikings games and like I, I'm like, oh, we can get them online, you know? And so I try to use the download streaming and it's always choppy. And I just figure like everybody else in my neighborhood is probably streaming data too. So <clears throat> I asked the guy one time and I was like, so like you just have me like keep waiting and pressing the retest button. I was like, is there some magic like knob or button that you're turning over there at your, wherever I'm talking to you that like speeds up my internet and slows it down? He's like, no, basically we're just waiting for like less people to be on the internet so we can show you how fast your speed is or not. So I was like, Oh, then can we just hang up the phone? Cause I don't need to like, if you're not doing anything magic on your end and we're just waiting for less people to be on the internet for my speed to be faster. So if you kind of think of it like a, a pipeline or a highway and the more people they have on it, the slower your connection is, the less people you have on it, um, the faster your connection is. Um, that's where you just want to be concerned about cloud-based services. If there's a ton of people all accessing Netflix or your favorite server at one time, um, Ticketmaster used to have a big problem with this when people try to buy tickets from them. Um, it can clog up um, certain applications, but um, you do want to be aware that if you're using the cloud on your phone, it is using data unless you're on a Wi-Fi network. So uh, we've talked a lot about security. Most cloud-based stuff has a separate login and password that you have to use to get into it. Um, that now, now that I say password, that was what my mom posted was this really long video or really long rant about uh, how people over 65 have to set their passwords. And so um, just all the requirements of, uh, of capital letters and combinations and you can't have multiple capital letters in the same order. and so she ended up having this really long password at the end of it that met all the requirements. And I was like, sorry, that password's already being used. So um, it just reminded me of that story that's supposed to say made me laugh. So um, it is, it is the cloud can be very secure. Uh, your stuff in the cloud is even more secure than keeping it on your computer because if your computer is stolen, um, it's literally like it's physical. You can access it. Uh, you can open parts and take apart parts to, to make them work if people really wanted to get your data from there. Um, but if they're stored in the cloud, downloading them to a new uh, device is simple, but you have to have the access. So if you lost your computer, you can make your computer, new computer, have all the files and access to stuff that it had before. And since they're not on your computer, um, your old computer, you access them on the cloud, it makes them harder to access. Um, a lot of the cloud storages uses really good encryption. I would say any of the reputable companies that you've heard of and you know, Microsoft, Google, OneDrive, Dropbox, Apple, iCloud, um, those are all 
companies that run really good encryption, uh, logins and passwords, they stay really secure. So Google and their biggest rivals use this approach uh, from the App Store. Um, so through the App Store, your movies, your music, your, you can use any of those things and you can restore them um, onto a mobile device simply by signing into your App Store account. So make sure you have a good login and password for your cloud devices. Yeah, I would say as, as is usually the case uh, with complex technological systems, the weakest uh, point in the system is the human beings that interact with it. Um, so if there is a security threat uh, for any of these services, the, the main security threat is, is your login and password, um, which is why if, if you're storing a bunch of sensitive stuff on Google Drive or in, in OneDrive, it's a really good idea to set up what's called two-factor authentication, um, where every time you sign in, um, it's going to send a code to your cell phone. Um, and you have to type in a quick code uh, just to confirm that it's you. It's very unlikely that a hacker would guess your password correctly and also have access to your telephone. So that's the number one thing you can do uh, to keep your stuff secure these days is, is having two-factor authentication. So well, I'm really lucky in that I know Colin and I know Wes down at Mankato Computer Technology, so I hear of scams and scans before they start to happen. Um, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I'm just as much a victim. I, I got a credit card stolen last year about this time. Um, my wife got the call from Wells Fargo yesterday. That there was fraudulent activity on her card. Somebody got a hold of her number and was using it at the, like the Walmart and somewhere else in Virginia. Um, I have been test driving, uh, based on Colin's recommendation, a, um, a program called LastPass which basically you create one master password <clears throat> and then it'll generate really good passwords for the rest of your sites. Um, <clears throat> it has a um, plugin to Chrome. So if you use Chrome as your browser, you can download LastPass. And then whenever you go to a website that you log into, it'll say one, do you want me to save this password? And then two, um, it'll do a search that says, this is a weak password. This is a password you use all the time would you like me to auto generate a password for this site? And it'll go in and do it automatically. I, it hasn't been completely seamless, but it's been pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it as a start. Um, Chrome also has a password manager incorporated into it. And that was pretty good for me for a while, but this is what happened. Um, there was a password that I use all the time. That was my old dog's name and her birthday. And, um, I used it for a lot of things for a long time. And I got an email that had that password as the subject headline. So at first, that really scared me. Then the email content was of a scan Wes had informed me of had been happening around Mankato for a while. And it basically says, we have video of you doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. Um, obviously, we have your password. So we know you logged into this site using this password. And if you don't send us a bunch of Bitcoin money, we're gonna send this video to everybody in your address book because we've hacked it. So luckily I'd heard of that scam before. So I called Wes and said, hey man, look, like somebody tried to do this for me, what does this mean? And he said, well, it means that somebody was able to access the database where your login was that email and that password was your password. We basically said, wherever you use that password, you should go in and change it and, um, so that's when I went and downloaded LastPass because I was like, I got to figure out which websites I use this password for so I can get rid of them. And then LastPass also does, I think it's called a Sentry report, which tell S-E-N-T-R-Y. So that's like it runs a security report on there for you to tell you these are websites that have had security breaches. So you probably want to go in and change your password. These passwords are rated highly secure. These passwords, you, you've repeated this password X amount of times. So the reports and information that it gives you are really cool. You do have to create a pretty intense password um, to meet their qualifications to have a master login to their service. And you're trusting all of your passwords into one service. But I honestly feel better about having a bunch of randomly generated passwords into one service than I do my ability to create 16 digit passwords that are randomly generated for every website that I go to. So. 
Um, it's a lot more likely that one site is going to get hacked with a weak password than it is um, all of those sites are going to get hacked because of that one protection. So it's called LastPass, L-A-S-T-P-A-S. Cool parts, it's free. Um, it's, uh, like I said, it's not completely seamless. It's not super duper easy to use, um, but it's pretty logical. And the thing I was most excited about was that, um, like I said, I've been using the Google Chrome password manager and that has the ability for you to download all of your passwords and the websites that you use them for. So that's the spreadsheet I had downloaded to find out, okay, where's that password that has my dog's name and birthday in it. And, uh, so I found all of those, so I went in automatically and changed all those. Then when I downloaded LastPass, I found out that you can import that spreadsheet into LastPass and it'll accept all the passwords from there. So if you've been using some other way to manage your passwords or if by some chance you've been keeping them in a Word document, a Excel document, you can import that into LastPass and it'll take all the websites, the addresses and the passwords and put them all into a file for you and then run the report and say, do you want me to change these? Do you want me to keep these? So <clears throat> it's a cool way to manage and keep your data um, secure and safe. So LastPass, I'm giving it my full endorsement at this point. Colin, are you still thumbs up on that program? Yeah, it seems like a, a very good solution, especially for folks who have got just dozens and dozens of accounts to, to keep track of. Uh, it makes it really handy and it seems to be pretty secure. So I'm still pushing it. Okay. Yeah. I had about 160 passwords. So, um, you know, about 10 of them were repeated over and over. So, um, so your data is safe in the cloud. Like I said, if you manage and pick a good passwords, most of your cloud services, um, are going to be really good about your security. So, Um, the cloud is free of full storage. There's lots of places you can go um, from an app called Box to Dropbox, Google to Apple. There's plenty of free stores to be had in the cloud. Many companies use a small amount of free storage as a way to get you into their clouds in hopes that you'll pay for more additional storage. So not a bait and switch, but just a cool way to find that it's convenient and go, if I had more of this, I could do a lot more fun stuff. It's generally free. Um, most cloud applications are free, though you have to have an internet connection to use them. Some require a paid subscription for a certain level of service. So like um, TV wise, if anybody's using, if anybody has tried to cut the cord on their entertainment wise, um, like you can access ESPN with your charter membership or your cable subscription, but you can't access ESPN plus without a paid subscription to ESPN. Um, HBO Go comes with charter service. HBO Now is an extra subscription. So like you can get the CBS channel, but you can't get CBS Plus. So there's a difference in what you can and can't access. So obviously they're like, oh, we know you're getting this for free. If you'd like our premium content, you can pay for more. So um, that's how they do it with both cloud storage and cloud-based applications. These are the logos that you'll see, and this is how much they're giving out for free to start. <clears throat> a gigabyte is not a lot of memory. Um, I mean, especially if you consider like iCloud, when's the last time they released an iPhone that only had five gig of storage? So if you wanna back up your iPhone to the cloud, um, they keep making phones that'll store more and more data. And the idea is that you'll also be paying your $9.99 a month or 99 cents a month for the upgraded iCloud subscription to go with your iPhone. Um, Google Drive, um, honestly, because all I really back up on Google is Google Docs. Um, I've never really exceeded the 15 gigabyte, um, maximum there. Dropbox has become, like I said, because I had a hard time working with it in real time. I don't like using Dropbox, but we do get a lot of, um, plans for when we have to do estimates and stuff. A lot of the general contractors will share, um, their blueprints on Dropbox because they have big files that they have to share and they can't email them, so they share them on Dropbox, they give you a link, and it's secure, so only the people they want bidding their projects look at them that way, it's kind of cool. I like and personally support OneDrive, um, but I also am more than willing to pay for the Office 365 subscription. A big reason why is just like Mike has talked about the last couple times is the updating. Um, I'd rather just have, always have the latest version of Word and the latest version of PowerPoint and the latest version of, of 
all the Office files. And because I have Office 365 subscription, that gives me a terabyte of OneDrive. I can access OneDrive through my Apple devices. I can access OneDrive through my mobile devices. Um, I like OneDrive. I have a work OneDrive and I have a personal OneDrive and I even have those backing up each other so I can access my OneDrive stuff from my personal account and from my work account on uh, almost on a daily basis. So um, I like OneDrive a lot. We use iCloud, but we really only, we pay 99 cents a month. I don't remember how many gigabytes that gets us. I want to say 100 gigabytes, um, which is enough to back up like my phone, my wife's phone. And uh, we still have to be kind of picky about what parts of our phone we have backed up, but the majority of it. And uh, so those are, those are the big ones. Colin, do you have another one on there besides those big four that you know of? Uh, those are kind of the, the major ones for sure. Um, the, there are other ones, but I, I, these are pretty ubiquitous. So I would say to, you'd probably be good sticking with these. Okay. So oh, Google Drive is a cloud storage service and like any cloud storage service, its main purpose is to expand your ability to store files beyond the limits of your hard drive. So um, again, this just comes to you. It gives you the ability to, instead of having to save a bunch of stuff on your computer, you can save it on the cloud. If you want to download it to your computer to use it, you can, and the files should sync while you're using them back and forth to the cloud and your computer. It's a pretty cool function. So the cloud is a, a, just a couple of review points here. It's collections of massive servers and acre filling complexes all owned by some of the world's largest corporations, which means that our data sits on computers that we don't have access to. Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, they all have invested huge amounts of money in creating homes for our personal data. Should you use the cloud? Um, you get more space, less money. A fee for unlimited storage in the cloud is cheaper than buying and maintaining lots of hard drive and storage space. People still buy hard drives to multiple levels of storage in their home and offices, but any physical device um, you could lose for different reasons. So um, I, I don't know. I have a, I have a, <laughs> Colin can attest to the fact that I have a tote full of old hard drives and uh, portable storage units and USB sticks that <clears throat> either have data on them that they, they, they don't work or they don't access anymore or a fan quit or the power supply quit. So um, while those things are getting cheaper and better and lasting longer all the time, um, because I've been in computing for such a long time, I just have a, a large collection of things that have stopped working on me. Um, there's solid hard drives now and solid state uh, memory devices that work way better than the old ones with a fan and a power source. But um, I would rather trust somebody that can build a warehouse full of those things than try to build up the collection on my desk and remember which storage device I have it on. However, I have tried to replicate my own cloud at home that I have a unit that's plugged into my network um, that I do have media and stuff on so that I can access that cloud, like a little two terabyte storage device. I can access that, it's plugged into my router and then I can access that on my local cloud, I guess, if you will. So it's not very smooth, it's a little janky, but I tried to do my own cloud before I found out how easy it was to store stuff in the big company's clouds. Well, one thing I'll say too is that uh, the, the one thing about every hard drive that you can count on for sure is that they're going to die eventually. Um, so it, on a long enough timeline, any hard drive will fail. That means the hard drive in your computer is going to eventually fail. Any external hard drive you plug in to back it up will someday fail. Um, and uh, it is uh, a good practice to do a backup that is not just comprehensive, but easy. And it's going to be something that, that you're going to do regularly. Um, the nice thing about a lot of these cloud services is that they're sort of set it and forget it. Um, it's, it's something that happens regularly without you having to worry about it. And then if, if there's a problem, it starts to complain um, that it needs your attention. But if you download something like OneDrive, it'll have a certain number of folders that it's going to automatically back up. You can tell it if you want to back up other folders. And then just every time your computer is on the internet, it's going to update that uh, your, your 
photos, your documents, all that good stuff to the cloud. Same with, with a program like Google Desktop, you know, uh, and they're getting better all the time as it's becoming more and more common for, for all of us to, you know, constantly be online and to have so much of our data in the clouds. They're getting a lot better at, at um, making that smoother and easier so we, so we don't have to think about it quite as much. Okay. I think that's it, Trevor. That's it. Oh my. It's way easier when I get to see all your happy faces and we're in the same room and we just get to talk. Um, but uh, so we didn't specifically talk about um, how to download pictures. I want to address that. Is the person that asked that question here? You can raise your hand or because if you can type in like what device you have and what cloud service you use, we'd be glad to explain how you can download your pictures from the cloud. Or any other any other questions or any other information? You can check out the videos, they're really cool. If you download the presentation or just copy and paste the links, both of the videos uh, give a little bit more, inter they have a little bit higher budget for uh, production quality and get to do some cool stuff that you can see and talk about what we just did today, or if you just search YouTube. Um, the problem with some of the YouTube stuff is it goes really into um, acronym heavy explanations of what the cloud is. So we just try to keep it simple and talk about um, how you use it. Um, okay, we'll talk about <laughs> basically, if you take a picture on your phone, and um, you can have settings to, to back up your um, phone. You can send your pictures, like I have an iPhone, so I have iCloud, but I can send, I have my pictures on here that I can back up to all of Google, Microsoft, and iCloud. So um, I can access those through my photos, and if I want to download them, I can look through any of the clouds, and usually there's, um, a circle with an arrow on it and that's what means download Colin showed us when um, he was on the website and he wanted and he showed us how to download the presentation that's downloading from the cloud or from the internet so um, you just push that button yeah if you want to go yeah So that arrow right there, that, and when Colin Hellifer's over it, it says download. So on your phone, it'll download right to your photos, but it, usually I would think more people want to download it to like their computer so they can print it. So it's gonna be the same thing. You want to log into whatever cloud service um, that you have a subscription to. So if it's Google, you log into Google. If it's OneDrive, you log into OneDrive. If it's iCloud, you log into One uh, iCloud. Then you find the file that you want and download it. And it'll just like when Colin clicked on the button there, it showed you where you want to save it. So usually you save it to a folder called my pictures or something along those lines, or you can just save it to your desktop. That's where um, I try to avoid saving stuff to my desktop. unless I know I'm just going to use it like one time because I like to have a very neat and organized desktop. So you can save it to your desktop and then um, you can do with it what you want from there. You can open it, you can edit it, you can share it, you can print it, you can attach it, you can send it in the email. Um, there's a lot of things. So um, so um, the one thing that about if you lose a phone, uh, or a device is, is like Colin said, is having that automatic setting to make sure that you're storing and backing up your files. Um, Google and Microsoft don't automatically sync to the cloud like my iCloud does on my iPhone. So um, I know it's different if you have like a, I want to say Droid, but I don't know if that's right, Colin. So like if you're using a Samsung device or the what's the other operating system besides iOS for a phone? Android. Okay, Android. That's okay. So Android. So if you're using an Android phone, they usually sync better with Google uh, applications. And I would imagine that you could have a setup to say, whenever I take a picture, save it. And I know you can do that because my boss has years and years of pictures that if he ever asks you if you want to see a picture of something, just say no 
because he can never find anything. He's like, here, let me scroll through 10 million pictures. He's like, ah, I don't know what's on there somewhere. So I know you can automatically save that, but for me on my phone, um, my iCloud pictures save automatically because it's an iPhone, but I have to open my Google Photos app <laughs> and it has to, well, I have it set up because I have, a, I have to have an internet connection because I don't want to use data to sync to my cloud. So if I'm sitting at work and I want to sync my phone um, pictures, then I'll click on the button and tell Google Photos, here, sync my pictures, sync all the pictures that are on my phone now. And then I have to go to Microsoft to do the same thing, sync all the pictures that I have on my phone now. And it does it relatively quickly. Occasionally, um, I'll take a ton of pictures for work, like at a job site or something, and it'll take a little bit longer to update. So, um, you, uh, so I've never really taken pictures with a laptop before. I don't have a laptop with a camera. But I would imagine if you are using the app that's based, like if you have a Microsoft laptop and you're using like Microsoft Photos to take pictures and you use the OneDrive to back up, or if you have an Apple, Colin, you might, I don't know if you're I looking think, at the chats, Colin. Yeah, I'm, I think what they might be asking there is, is if, uh, if they've got, if they're logged into the cloud on their phone, will, will their computer also be backed up? And the short answer is no. Um, you would need to uh, use whatever service. If you're using like Google Drive for your phone, you would want to log into Google on your computer um, and download the Google Desktop program uh, to do the data sync. And then it, it will go through and identify what, uh, what locations on the computer you want to back up to your Google Drive. Alternatively, you can download iCloud uh, if you're using an iPhone um, and, and you're already using the iCloud storage. Uh, there is a desktop version of that as well. And it's a similar process. You need your Apple ID, um, sign into iCloud and, and download uh, iCloud for, for Windows. Um, and then uh, that will ask you, you know, what parts of the computer you want to back up. Usually, the, it'll default to something like your your desktop, your pictures folder, and your documents folder. Um, and if you have stuff stored other ways, you can you can go into the settings and uh, and identify those areas. And then, Colin, I'm not going to expect you to be an expert in this area, but I know when you get a phone from the Verizon store, like Verizon has their own cloud app. And I know like if you go in and out of buying a lot of Verizon phones, they can download a lot of your information from that Verizon cloud app. But I'm just imagining that that's redundant compared to like an Android one or uh, using Google or using iCloud. Yeah, they have, you, a, they have a Verizon backup uh, app. I know, um, I'm not really sure the specifics of how it works. I go through Verizon and I just use my Google Drive to sync everything um, because Android is pretty, um, because I have an Android phone, uh, which is made by, the operating system is made by Google. It's pretty slick to back up all of my stuff, my, my, uh, my photos, all my contacts, my messages, um, that stuff can all be, synced into the Google Drive uh, just by downloading the app and signing in. So yeah, what it's it's whatever works. If Verizon set up a cloud service for you and you know where they're at and the, and the pictures are all stored, whether it's through Verizon or through a different service, it's, it's whatever works and whatever you know that you can ask somebody like, hey, I was storing them all here and now they're gone, where did they go? Um, that That's the biggest thing. And that's where, like I said, I have, a lot of storage between those three services and I literally have almost everything I own backed up in triplicate because I back it up to the Google Drive, I back it up to OneDrive, and I back it up to iCloud um, as much as possible. So it gets a little repetitive, but <clears throat> it's nice to know that when I'm really looking for something specific, if I can't find it in one location, I might be able to find it in another. So I know my Google Photos does some geotagging, which means it'll keep track of where I took the pictures at. So if I can remember where I was when I took a picture that I'm looking for, I can type that in. And then iCloud does some facial recognition. So if I know it's somebody I'm looking for, 
Um, I can type in like my daughter's name or a friend's name and say, you know, look for pictures of this person or that person. So each one has its own unique fun features that, um, depending on how you want to search for them or how you like, they use them well. So Google, like I said, geotags them because Google Maps and um, the geotagging part of it. Apple does a really good idea, a, a really good job with the facial identification and facial recognition. Um, so it takes a little time to set those things up, but um, my, one of my funniest stories is I'm, I'm not much of an angler or a fisherman, but, um, and there's several fishermen I know that I wouldn't think are very technologically advanced. But I do know that they, if somebody shows them a picture of their fish on their phone, they're like, hey, let me see that. And it doesn't take long for the other person to grab the phone out of their hand because you know that they're pushing on their phone to see where they took that picture at because they know just enough on the phone to figure out like, oh, where were you at? Where were you on German Lake? Or what bay were you on when you took that picture of you catching that fish? So um, I know fishermen get really protective of their pictures of their fish if they have geotagging on, on Google Docs. So. Um, just one of those things that, I, that I've seen and experienced that uh, people don't like to share the locations of the cool pictures that they're taking. So, well, I think we have a little extra time before Zoom, uh, some Zoom kicks us off. Does anybody else have anything? Is there anything else somebody wanted to learn about the cloud tonight or any questions you have? This was learning about it, storing stuff on the cloud. How do you, um, I was running into problems with my cell phone, so I uploaded a lot of files to Google Drive. Yep. And I want to go out there and look to see, sort them out, put them in like folders so I don't have <laughs> tens of million fo photos to go through. But that's where I'm having some problem with is to actually being able to do it. Okay. Any recommendations Colin, on that? Colin, since you're sharing your screen, do you have access to Google Drive here so you can show them how to create new folders and sort stuff in here or no? Uh, I do. Hopefully, I don't have anything embarrassing in my Google Drive. <laughs> Hopefully, it's all in folders. <laughs> you want to go through that a little slower, Colin, just to show what buttons you push to get to your Google Drive? Because I'm oh, sure yeah. this is through Chrome. Sure. Um, so when you're on your new tabs page if you're signed in to google you're gonna have your uh your little icon up here um that starts usually with the first uh letter of your name right next to this are the the google apps if you click on these um then you can select drive so tom drive is kind of the home base for google so yeah. when you're in google docs drive is like what you would click on if you clicked on the folder tab on a windows 10 device at the bottom when you want to see everything that your computer has that's where google drive is yeah. now the cool the cool thing about this is that even though i'm in a web browser uh if i right click it's going to give me these specific functions um so i'm going to right click with the mouse and select new folder um and for our purposes i'll call it demonstration and now i've got this folder here um, and if i wanted to move an existing document uh into here um then i can right click on the existing document go to move to and then I have to drill down a bit uh, into my drive to select the folder I want to send it to. Um, Colin, I can, can you do the drill down on the, on the left-hand side of the screen too, just where it goes from my drive so they can see the folders over there too, on the, on the left side of the screen where you click on the little arrow and it does the pull down for my drive? Does it move it there or just copy it there? It'll move it, yep. Okay. Um, I guess I'm not sure what you're asking, Trevor. I wish I could, I, I want to just touch it and show you all on the left side where it says drive and then new and then it says my drive. If you click on that oh, arrow, yeah, yeah, yeah yep. pull down. So there's the folder. So if you wanted to see a folder view for your organization ways, because um, I'm one of those people that I need to see it. I like to see it laid out on the left hand side of the screen versus just on the where I'm at. So 
um, that gives you an idea. So if you, and then Connolly, show them how if now if you click on demonstration at that same, at the same location we were just on the left, far left side there, if you click that, it shows you what's inside of that folder. So it's sorted and organized just like Microsoft or Windows would be. And if you want to select multiple things, you can hold control. Oh, maybe you can't in. Uh... Oh, that's probably because I'm in quick access. Yeah. Yeah, if you hold control and uh, left click on, uh, then you can see we're, we're selecting multiple files here so that we don't have to go through the onerous process of, of moving each one individually, then we can right click and hit move to, um, and we can move to that, that folder there. So now those multiple files are in that folder. Okay. Make sense? Yes. And iCloud and uh, OneDrive are, so OneDrive literally mirrors the operating system of Windows. So it, like when you're in OneDrive, it should look just like it does when you're in Windows. In fact, that's my folder on OneDrive looks just like if I'm accessing my hard drive or I'm accessing my My Docs. It's just I have a folder called OneDrive and I have OneDrive Personal and I have OneDrive Master Electric. And when I click on them, it unfolds just like it would. And it'll show me if it's just in the cloud or if it's on my computer. So if you have, um, in my case, I have two different email addresses. Um, can I tie those both together in the drive as one unit? or do I'll show, them, show them on the login. Because I'm the same way, Tom. I have my personal, which is my Gmail. And then I have a master electric one. Okay. So it's it's going to be right here where Colin's at. You click add another account. Yeah. And then you go, you'll have to go back and forth in between them. The hard part there is that if it's a document that's shared with you, if you don't have the rights to share it back and forth, um, like all my master electric stuff, I have one of my spreadsheets that's like my 2019 jobs that was shared to my Gmail, but the rest of them are only shared with my master electric email. So in Chrome, I'm always logged in via Gmail, but when I go to Docs, I have to click on that seat, like where Colin C is, I have to click on that and change it to my Master Electric one. But yeah, you can leave both, you can leave however many Google accounts you have signed in at the same time. It's just, you're only gonna be able to access what was shared with that email while you're logged in as that person. So if you have multiple accounts, you can click on that C and then change which account you wanna be logged into to get access to which document. Where do you go to uh, share it then? So that if I'm logged into one, I can see that plus the other. Account. So you have to have you have to have rights to it, but that's going to be right there. Share where where Colin's at. So he just clicked on the document and then clicked on share. Oh, there he is. Okay, so you have to do that with each document then. Well, what do you if? You could do it with a whole folder if you had organized yeah. things that you want to share between and you sent them all into a single folder, uh, you can you can right click on the folder and uh, um, and hit share. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Anybody else? Colin's a whiz. This is my favorite part when Colin has to push the buttons and do fun stuff on the computer. Do you think we'll be back at uh, buying next month? That I have no idea. Uh, Mike, you probably have a way better pulse on that. I have no idea if we'll even have school in the fall yet or not. So I'm just dying in my haircut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, Tom, we, we are waiting to hear what the reports are from the, the governor's office as far as opening and what parts of Vine get opened when and what um, what we have to put into place in order to make that happen. Okay. Yeah, and I'd honestly, like I hate talking with a mask on, so I'd probably rather teach another class via Zoom than have to be in front of people with a mask on and oh, yeah, I be, in, be in a room Basically, and what we're, the limits. We're looking at right now is everything is being planned 
uh, as far as programming goes as a Zoom presentation. And if we are able to, we will switch to in-person. Okay. Which, which I think our next class is how to do a Zoom presentation, right, Mike? Is that what we decided today? <laughs> I'll actually just stay in, in touch. Right. Um, I'll stay in touch during these kinds yeah, of so times. things like Zoom, things like FaceTime or yep. other, other things. We, we all wish we had talked about that <laughs> months ago, but little did we know. That might be a good idea, though, how to uh, present or put on a Zoom meeting. Yep. Uh, only for the fact that most of us belong to multiple organizations, and there's a number of people that don't want to mess with it, you know, and just call you up and say, we got to do this, okay, fine. And it's like, it might be, you know, just as easy to do it as a Zoom meeting. Yep, I sense yep. a I sense a couple of slides coming in Trevor's future. <laughs> Ouch. Well, for us with Zoom, what I'm thinking about is, you know, we've got one presentation planned with an actor in the Twin Cities. Uh, he was going to come down on his day off, but now he can do it from home, and that just opens up more possibilities. I don't know how many of you have attended some of the uh, Rome from home presentations we've had, but we had one f from just outside Jerusalem presenting to us. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple from near Ontario with the Royal Botanical Gardens, but if we can utilize that sort of uh, communications, we can really open up who we bring in for presentations. Yeah, absolutely. And we can also, also do a party after the party. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, if there's no more questions, I do this from I do this from my office because I have three kids at home and I know they couldn't be quiet for an hour and a half. So I try to come to an uninterrupted spot, but I would love to get home to my kids and my wife and see them all before it's bedtime. So um, if there's no more questions, you're welcome to reach out to uh, us, Colin. What are you guys? What's your status for being open? Are you guys via phone or? Yeah. So right as of right now, we're we're still doing all of our work remotely. Um, okay. But uh, we're working on a plan to to reopen the service depot to do physical hardware work. Um, that'll probably come next week. Um, okay but it'll be a, it'll be a little bit different we'll probably be meeting folks out by their car to grab the computer um and anything that we can do remotely we will be doing remotely um so as long as your computer turns on and uh connects to the internet we should be able to help you without without you having to bring it in so well colin you want to give a quick plug for the that service that you guys have so you can access people's computers like if they were part of that that you could work on their computers from yeah remotely. and we've we've gotten a little more flexible on that now um because we because of the the present circumstances we are doing remote work for for anybody who needs it at this point but there is a software package that we sell called premier care which for 99 dollars a year has three pieces of software on it um, it's got Webroot Enterprise Antivirus, which is a great antivirus program. Uh, it's got LiveDrive, which is a cloud backup program that backs up all your stuff automatically to the cloud. Um, and then the final thing is it's got our remote tool on it so that, you know, if you're having problems, we can help you out without you having to bring the computer in. It's the same sorts of services we provide for our business clients, um, but uh, we, we do that for consumers as well. So so just like Colin can see, you guys can all see Colin's computer now. Basically, their service provide the service they provide would be that you could just log into your computer, and Colin would be able to see whatever's on your computer if you allowed him that access or subscribe to that care. So if you're like, oh, this little link right here, or this little thing on my screen right here, or this always does this when I click on here, um, they can see that. You wouldn't have to worry about bringing it in or disconnecting it or bring it into the shop. So. And then, like, again, to reiterate what Mike's concerned about, about with the updates and stuff, like Colin said, that it's a great service to have the virus protection running in the background that they update, they manage, um, to have the live, live, is it live drive? I always want to say live wire, but it's live drive. Yep, live drive. The backup service, so it backs up automatically. So 
to have your virus stuff done automatically, your backup stuff done automatically, and then as soon as you have a question, um, somebody remotely can look at your computer and see exactly what you're seeing, and you can say, this is wrong, this isn't how this is supposed to be, um, or how do I move these files from here to there, and probably even easier than me pointing at my screen that Colin can't see, <laughs> um, you could actually show them. So a really cool and unique service that they, those guys offer to help keep you up and running. Is that available for both Mac and PC? It is, yep. Okay, thank you. And we do use that down at Vine. So it's great when sometimes Lisa tries to, to fix something and we say, still not working. We just have them uh, go right to our computer desktop and go, you sit there and you watch everything opening up and closing and cursor moving around and suddenly it's all fixed. I have a question now that Trevor brought it up, uh, is that they have live drive for, uh, I'm assuming backing up uh, the hard drive in the computer. Mm -hmm. How is that different than like uh, Google Drive or OneDrive or iCloud or you know any of those others? It's not too terribly different. the The main thing is that if you if you buy live drive on its own. Uh, I think it's about $60 a year and it's unlimited storage. Um, yeah. So, uh, but it, it functions very much the same way. Uh, it has a process that runs in the background that checks to see if the files have changed and then it up, up, uploads the changed files or any files that have changed, uploads those to the cloud. Um, and then if you are on a different computer or if your computer dies, uh, you can log into a website uh, and see all your files and download them from there. Well, and, and Colin, I, if I'm correct, LiveDrive will give it to where, we talk about this in the backup class, about like a complete restore versus just having access to your files, right? No, nope. LiveDrive, nope. LiveDrive, LiveDrive does not do an image backup, no. It's just files. Okay, okay. just wanted to clear that up. Okay. But across multiple services, the benefit is also good where LiveDrive can go across all of those things where if you, if you keep them all in one space, like there are all your photos are in iCloud, awesome. But, um, you know, if you run across where it's like, okay, I use Google for my photos, I use iCloud for my music, I use this, um, and I have copies on my, all, all those copies on my hard drive, then LiveDrive gives you a way to bridge across all of those services. But if you use one of those services to, to keep track of all of your files, like if all of your music, your pictures and your audio and your documents are all on OneDrive, hey, more power to you. And yeah, LiveDrive's redundant at that point, but. Another good question. No dark web questions, Tom. Oh, darn. <laughs> Thank you. I have to leave. I have another okay. Zoom. I have another Zoom meeting at seven o'clock. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Schedule. <laughs> yeah, well, great seeing everyone. Look forward to seeing you in person soon. But uh, we'll keep doing these Zoom classes as long as my guys is too. We we really enjoy it and glad to help you guys out. Thanks, Trevor. All right. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All together. Appreciate it. Great yeah. work. We'll see you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.